Indian Island in Fishing Bay at East Sound, Orcas Island, is one of the most diverse and most urbanized of shoreline habitats in the San Juan Islands. And it is changing dramatically as a result of climate change and human activity. I'm Russell Borsch, director of Quiot, and I have coordinated 12 years of monitoring of change in the wildlife and habitats of Indian Island, working with local volunteers and staff scientists from our organization to try to understand how people and climate change are affecting this unique urban marine preserve. As an overview, 2021 involved a heat wave that exacerbated many of the conditions that we had seen deteriorating around Indian Island over the last few years, and that have gradually eroded the biodiversity of the marine ecosystem in Fishing Bay. The impacts tend to be greatest on species that are resident in the bay, as opposed to those that visit the bay only seasonally in order to spawn or to rear. Let's begin with habitat conditions and with eelgrass as one of the critical kinds of habitat that support the marine invertebrates and fishes in Fishing Bay. Eelgrass density has fluctuated from year to year since 2009 when we began monitoring with no clear trend. But deeper eelgrass has always been thinner than eelgrass closer to shore in shallower water because of the effect of cloudiness from silt road runoff uh, in deeper water. In this graph, you can see the uh, dark bars represent the density of eelgrass at shallow water, about minus one foot. Uh, the green bars, which are shorter for most of this graph, represent the eelgrass at minus three feet in deeper water where there's more of an effect of cloudiness or turbidity in the water above the eelgrass meadow. You can see that in the last year, that's this year, 2021, there's been a reversal of the relationship between the two. And here in this graph, you can see this as a ratio of deep to shallow with a plunge at the uh, 2021 at the very right hand side that shows that for the first time in our monitoring, the shallow eelgrass has done more poorly than the deeper eelgrass. Now we consider that this could be partly the result of the heat wave that we experienced early in the summer, but it didn't really have that much of an effect on eelgrass when we counted it. So we are also considering that this is a result of more trampling and human activity visitors to the, um, to the habitat affecting the growth and survival of the eelgrass in those shallow areas that are exposed more times during the year. Another critical habitat is the beach itself. As a result of winter storms, fine sands and muds continue to accumulate throughout Fishing Bay at a rate of as much as a half inch a year. This influx of finer material covering or smothering the older, coarser gravels and sands is perfect for uh, so-called softshell clams like the Macoma genus, but it has had an adverse effect on the so-called hard-shelled clams like steamers and butters that have historically been mainstays of uh, the human diet in the islands. And in this graph, you can see the colored bars represent different years. Uh, on the left-hand side, you can see a rapid decline over the last dozen years in the abundance of steamers. And on the right-hand side, a dramatic increase in the 
abundance of the uh, of the macomas of two species of macomas that we have that are again uh, lovers of finer sediments that comfortable in compact fine sand as opposed to the gravelier substrates that the steamers and butters like here's another graph that shows uh, how serious this is over time uh, you can see the, the blue and orange bars in here uh, are the steamers and the butters. This is an age diagram. It shows that the hard shell clams are aging out, that where we do find them, they are older and older and are consequently living out their lives but not being replaced by younger clams of the same species. They're being replaced by the macomas, by the soft shell clams. Now, if we move from the sandy beaches to the cobbly beaches, we have an interesting index of crab nursery activity that gives us a sense of how well that cobbly beach is doing uh, crabs, uh, juvenile crabs, and the smaller crabs that live around Fishing Bay rear underneath the cobbles in the beach basically hiding underneath the cobbles when the tide is out and this is an environment this is a habitat that can be heavily disturbed by people walking around turning things over visitors to the island inevitably no matter how careful they are disturb this kind of habitat so how has this affected the crab populations that are living underneath well um, what you'll see in this graph is that while all, all of the crab population taken together has increased, its diversity has decreased. So the blue bars, which you see rising to the right-hand side of the graph, the blue bars are green shore crabs, which are the one species that seems to be indestructible <laughs> under these circumstances widespread indestructible they are thriving and they alone are increasing in numbers where the other color bars which represent purple shore crabs black clawed crabs and the little flat top porcelain crabs which were originally our mascot our icon for our program at indian island all have been decreasing and you can see as you move to the right, in particular, the porcelain crabs and the purple shore crabs have nearly disappeared. Another denizen of the cobbly beach are sea stars. While the larger sea stars, for the most part, are more likely to be seen subtidally rather than in the intertidal zone on minus tide days, Many of the smaller sea stars and some species actually prefer the intertidal for hunting and will also be seeking shelter underneath the rocks and cobbles on the rockier and cobbler beaches and around tide pools. They too have taken a hit and uh, we have seen a decrease in diversity uh, and a decrease in numbers which probably is mostly driven over the last five or ten years by warming water but let's also take a look at the potential impact of sea star wasting disease which hit the indian island community in 2014. in this graph you can see a very sharp decline in the multicolored bars that represent the total numbers of several species of sea stars that historically we found underneath the rocks and in the cobbly beaches and tide pools around Indian Island. Uh, most dramatically, uh, you can see that uh, ochre stars and the uh, sun stars, the big multi-armed stars, 12 to 24 armed stars, used to be rearing underneath the rocks. We're seeing fewer and fewer of them under the rocks, mostly seeing, if at all, brittle stars, which are very tiny and actually live in crevices so small that they're pretty well sheltered from human activity. Uh, the larger stars rearing under the rocks 
have declined, in fact, have almost completely disappeared from that habitat around the island. Now, uh, we believe that that's mostly because of trampling and disturbance. And if we take a look at a graph of the ochre star population, not just under the rocks, but exposed in tide pools and along the rocky shoreline all around Indian Island. That in this graph is represented by green bars. The higher the bar, the more ochre stars we saw on average over the course of a summer. You'll see that there's actually been an upward trend in the ochre stars since 2014, which was the year of the sea star wasting epidemic. Uh, if you can see a, a little tiny red bar uh, next to the green bars, that's the number of sea stars that we found that were actually suffering from wasting syndrome. So put this together, the ochre stars, while they had some losses to sea star wasting in 2014, and there was a bit of mortality from this for several years, the wasting syndrome has almost completely disappeared and you can see that the overall trend for this species has been upward. So full recovery and perhaps more than recovery. Yet the total diversity of stars has gone down. This is the one species. Again, we have one species that is tolerating the disturbance like the green shore crabs and in this case, the ochre stars, whereas the other species that we used to find in combination with them or in association with them uh, appear to be in trouble. So let's go to fishes. Now the fishes, for the most part, are more mobile. They can move around. They can avoid, to some extent, habitat conditions that small invertebrates, even if they have legs and are mobile, generally cannot. And we have a number of index fishes that we pay particular attention to. They tell the whole story. The first one we should look at is the bay pipefish, beautiful seahorse relative uh, that uh, is associated with eelgrass meadows. They are camouflaged in eelgrass meadows, feed on the small crustaceans that tend to hang around the eelgrass, and they reproduce around Indian Island in the eelgrass meadow there, probably the largest bay pipefish nursery in the Samhain Islands is, is right at our study site. So they make a very good, um, a very good indicator species for what's happening to fishes that rely on the eelgrass. As this graph shows, the overall trend, the red line in here, has been upward until the last two years. Overall, we've been seeing more bait pipe fish every summer, but we had a drop in 2020 and it continued to fall in 2021. So we actually are seeing some evidence that conditions have worsened. This could be partly the heat wave as an extreme event or the overall gradual increase in the temperature of the waters around Indian Island and the disturbance of that area may have begun to have its effect. Another indicator species, one that's more associated with the rocky intertidal zone around the island, is the plainfin midshipman. This is a really cool fish that um, spawns, uh, nests in the rocky intertidal, spawns in these beautiful rocky nests uh, just below the lowest tides, and in fact sings uh, very much an analogy to birds. Uh, they sing to attract mates to their nests. Uh, extremely cool and the overall trend around Indian Island has been for plain fin midshipmen to increase. Again here in this graph you see that the overall trend, the, the red trend line, is upward. We saw a significant increase in midshipmen uh, after um, uh, really after 2014, after the blob, the very warm summer we had almost a decade ago, but last two years, again, two bars on the right, you can see, dropped in 2020 and really plummeted in 2021. So our second indicator species, Plainfin midshipman, also fell during this two-year period and mostly in the last year. 
A third indicator species, one that we have always thought to be the most resilient, are shiner perch, a species, one of a number of species of surf perches that we have in our waters here. Uh, the uh, shiner perch are unusual because they move in big schools, they mass in shallow water during the summer when it is very warm, and they give live birth. So they have a completely different kind of reproductive strategy than the other fishes we use as indicators. And uh, their live birth, to some extent, is facilitated by having warm water for the young fishes to be birthed into. On the other hand, we have had some concern about what the upper limit of toleration of these fishes to warming waters might be. Um, here's a graph of shiner perch abundance year by year since our studies began in 2009. You can see with the red line, the trend line, that overall they've been stable as we would have expected during this entire period of time, except look on the right, 2021, there's a big drop this has been the worst year for shiner perch since monitoring began in 2009. So we may have hit the thermal limit uh, in the summer of 2021. Uh, shiner perch were around the bay uh, getting ready to berth when the heat wave hit and they may have been affected um, by the extreme warming of waters during that heat wave. Um, it's difficult to separate out the gradual warming from the shock of the extreme weather event, but the two, of course, are connected with overall climate change. So we can take them together and say, together the effects this summer have been negative, even for the shiner perch, which have come in at just a fraction of the numbers that we're used to seeing. So. These three indicator species are telling us that something has happened in the very short term, in the last two years. And, and so it may be because of the heat shock in the summer of 2021 combined with the overall gradual warming. But we do have other fishes that we can see gradually declining over more than a decade uh, suggesting that the heating, the, the gradual warming of water is having an effect on them, pot potentially also due to chemical and uh, other changes uh, from human disturbance. Here's a graph that shows you all those other species that we've been monitoring since 2009. Uh, the bars are again the years uh, stack to give you the total of all of these species that we're monitoring uh, as a, an annual average and the different colors of the different species. Pay particular attention to the yellow, which is forage fishes like herring, Pacific sand lance, and smelt. And you might notice that they were very abundant some years back in the past, uh, in the early teens, and have pretty well almost completely disappeared from the bay since then. Uh, the Greenlings as well, very common in the past, almost absent now. The only species you can see in here that has done well and has driven up the 2020 and 2021 total fish abundance in this graph are the uh, pricklebacks, snake pricklebacks, which are shallow, warm water loving fish that in most years visit Fishing Bay in order to reproduce to, to, to spawn and to rear. And so the pricklebacks have increased at the expense of almost all of the other fishes that we had originally identified as denizens, as regular denizens of the fishing bay ecosystem. So overall fish diversity is down and then dramatically down in the last year or two for the three species we looked at that are our key indicators of the, the health of the, of the immediate environment around Indian Island, the eelgrass meadow, and the rocky intertidal. Uh, I just have a, a, a rogue gallery to share of some of the species of fish that we are seeing little or none of anymore. Uh, the forage fishes and herring, we used to see herring spawning 
in Fishing Bay as recently as just six or seven years ago. The other surf perches like striped perch used to be pretty common and we rarely if ever see them anymore. Tube snouts, which sort of superficially look like bay pipefish, but are a very different fish. Little torpedoes, little golden torpedoes that school in shallow, sandy, and eelgrass habitats. Tube snouts are almost absent at this point. The greenlings, white spotted greenlings and kelp greenlings, uh, were rearing around uh, Indian Island 10 years ago, and we rarely see either of those species now. And perhaps saddest uh, for me, the saddest is the grunt sculpin, one of the most interesting fishes in the Salish Sea. The beautiful little strange clown-like striped orange and white fish uh, with an extraordinary life history that includes um, females chasing males into crevices in the rocks and holding them captive until they spawn. Uh, grunt sculpins have disappeared from Indian Island. They were seen regularly in the first few years of this study and have not been seen since. So we've lost a lot of interesting species and this is probably due to more than just the warming water. Indian Island itself, of course, also has a terrestrial ecosystem and without going into much detail about that, uh, we should add that the terrestrial ecosystem of Indian Island, which is part of the San Juan Islands National Monument since 2013. Wildflower meadows have uh, regenerated to some extent as a result of our efforts to uh, maintain a strict trail uh, limitation on human activity up there. But we are also seeing that the inevitable disturbance by so many people at the island, so much noise and so much traffic uh, has begun to have an effect on the bird community and in particular our black oyster catchers which have been emblematic of Indian Island essentially a special species of bird for visitors and one that is extremely rare to be found anywhere close to human habitations. Our black oyster catcher couple continues to nest every year but it has not been able to actually successfully raise chicks for a half dozen years now. So we're very concerned that uh, the human activity around Indian Island has begun to interfere with bird diversity as well. And this is something that uh, needs to be addressed. So let's summarize. What we're seeing is evidence of three major drivers of long-term change around Indian Island and in Fishing Bay. First, warming seas exacerbated by heat shocks like the heat wave we experienced in midsummer 2021. We can connect that to the reduced diversity of fishes and also to emigration of many of the species of sea stars and also the sea slugs downslope from the intertidal and upper subtidal into deeper water where we don't see them anymore on low tide days. So we've had a loss of fish diversity and a loss due to emigration of diversity of some of the invertebrates like sea stars because of temperature. A second major driver is urbanization, is the growth of the town of East Sound. Urban runoff, contaminated runoff water, uh, silty runoff water that produces cloudiness, turbidity in the water that cuts off the sunlight reaching, uh, reaching uh, eelgrass uh, down below, particularly deeper eelgrass. This has resulted definitely in thinning of eelgrass and also because it's moving sand and silt around, uh, this is part of a process which is shifting the infaunal bivalve population from the hard shell clams to the soft shell clams. Finally, the increase in human activity. Visitors to Indian Island during the summer minus tide days have increased from a couple of thousand to four or five thousand since we began monitoring in 2009. 
The increase in human activity is associated, of course, with trampling as well as turning over rocks and overall moving <laughs> material around where people go uh, and often, of course, handling things, although we try through our docenting and, sh and stewardship program to uh, discourage, to educate people and discourage them from handling animals. The disturbance is certainly associated with the decline of crab nurseries and crab diversity, as well as producing stress on all of the intertidal organisms, sea stars, fishes and shallows, and many of the invertebrates that are there and part of what makes the island tide pool so exciting that we haven't even had a chance to, to, uh, to explore more closely in this presentation. But this overall stress coming from more people is something that we can probably do more about then we can deal, for example, with the effects of climate change and ocean warming. So what are the challenges for protecting the island better? The biggest challenge, I believe, is that we have multiple jurisdictions. There are too many different institutions, agencies involved in uh, the different parts of the shoreline as well as the island itself. We have federal, state, county, private <laughs> and tribal landowners of Indian Island and Fishing Bay. Uh, all together, uh, an eight or nine different governmental entities, as well as a number of private landowners who share the shoreline and share the tide lands in the Ilgress Meadow. This means at this stage, inconsistencies, uh, lack of agreement on what should be protected, what should be uh, stewarded, what should be managed, and for whose benefit. There's no consensus on that. And at the same time, organizations like ours that are there on the ground doing research, education, and attempting to steward the resources of Indian Island and Fishing Bay deal with um, limited resources. Uh, we are relying and have continued to rely on annual donations and on volunteers. Uh, in fact, the presentation that I'm giving you, the, re the research, uh, is the result of close to 100 hours of volunteer time, counting, measuring, fishing, <laughs> collecting samples. And this is work that has been going on now for 12 years basically only through the care and the commitment of islanders that have helped out either by opening their wallets or by putting their boots on the beach. And so even if we can manage to agree on how to take care of things, what to take care of, we still have a reliance at this point on local people to take care of a resource that is being used by thousands of people every year from all over the Pacific Northwest and beyond. So what could we do? Certainly there are some things that we can do in terms of dealing with pollution and runoff. We can um, continue to improve upstream filtration of the road runoff from the town of East Sound. Some work was successfully done on this a few years ago, but existing facilities for upstream filtration, biofiltration, and sedimentation to keep the storm sewers clean uh, have overloaded at this point and the town continues to grow and we're getting more extreme rain events. So we simply have to do more to clean up the water before it gets into the bay. Better signage and guidance for visitors to the beaches and to the island would be great at this point, since there are multiple agencies, there's no agreement on what to tell visitors and no agreement on where to put the signs. But it's very important that people respect the island and the wildlife there. And uh, we need to get agreement on what the message is and get the message out better to visitors before they go to the island, uh, rather than while they are there. Uh, one thing that we could also do that we should take a closer look at is to ask the state of Washington to designate the entire bay, including the beaches and Indian Island, as an aquatic reserve. 
uh, state designation as an aquatic reserve would do two things that are very important. It would create a local council or board that includes all of the interested parties, all of the different agencies uh, that could make decisions collectively under state coordination, uh, get a plan that everybody can live with and that could be implemented with state resources. So um, dealing with that problem multiple jurisdictions would be advanced considerably if we could uh, get uh, aquatic reserve designation. And the other thing that's very critical about it is that it would give the people who live on Orcas Island a bigger voice because it would be community-based. Under state law, local organizations would be in the driver's seat rather than organizations, entities, government agencies whose offices are somewhere else. So bringing all of the interested parties together and having a stronger local voice uh, might be something that we need to do if we are to effectively manage pollution, the effects of growth, and the effects of visitors. That's the report for 2021. We hope to hear from uh, those of you who are interested enough to watch this and think about it and have you on the beach working alongside us and helping to keep Indian Island as productive and diverse and dynamic as we possibly can under the changing conditions that we face today.